So, when your computer tells you it's going to be another nine and a half hours to finish this process of restoring a backup, do you A. Smash computer to bits with sledgehammer, B. Drive back and forth over computer in car, C. Set fire to said computer, or D. Grab a camera and go to Florida. Welcome. This is the uh, Tarquin National Park, National Forest. Not exactly sure um, which that is. It's in Florida. Well, this is a lovely place. I must say, but um, does it ever get too hot for insects? I can't really see much going on. And of course it goes without saying that there's no birds here. It's weird, they've got this boardwalk that I'm walking on, uh, but it doesn't look like there's any reason you couldn't just be walking on the ground. Well, what I am hoping is that is that I can find some snakes down here. This is good habitat for things like the uh, coral snake, as well as all the usual viperous beasts that live down here in the south. But it, it looks awfully dry. Everything looks very dry. I suppose that's because it's 150 degrees. Well, actually, I take that back. There's a bit coming up that doesn't look very dry at all. Anyway, I'm looking for a place that I can get down off this boardwalk and uh, go explore and look for... Uh, look for creepy crawlies. I just brought one camera with me. One camera, one lens. This is my uh, this is my normal macro setup. I didn't even bring a flash. Um, which would probably be interesting to you if you had seen the last video. That I always carry a flash with me when I'm going to do macro photography. So that's the direction we came from, and it is absolutely gorgeous. And this is the damp pit coming up. It looks like a sea of some kind. Anyway, I'll stop talking and just let you enjoy the view here. A nice family walked past me uh, with some little children and uh, they stopped to chat and they, they asked, um, they pointed at some of the odder equipment that I have hanging off my bag and they, uh, the kids wanted to know what the stuff was for and it occurred to me that, that would be a good thing to uh, to talk about. It might be easier to uh, wait till I get to a stopping point and then I'll just empty out my bag and show you what's in it. It's about the same stuff I always take when I go on an adventure. So 
yeah i'll do that shortly to you it'll seem like instantaneous because i'm just going to stop recording now and then i'll start again when i'm doing it the magic of technology eh brilliant so i thought i'd stop for just a minute and uh, answer that question i was going to ask earlier of, of what what's what's the stuff hanging out of my bag well i'll show you i'll show you what i've got so a new addition to my uh, to my bag, and this is now something I, I take out with me uh, everywhere I go, is one of these gimbal thingamajigs that that everybody uh, uh, everybody seems to have. Now, I'd never owned one before, and um, honestly, this one I after I bought it, I looked it up. Uh, it was on sale at my local camera shop, and. Um, it looked fancy and it feels nice and solid and it's made of metal so i thought it must be must be great one uh and it was on sale for like i think it was originally priced at 300 dollars, and it was on sale for a hundred dollars so i bought it and then when i got home i looked up the reviews on it and um yeah a bit disappointing they, they don't make them anymore in fact the company's gone out of business not very promising and apparently it doesn't have any of the features of the new ones which was to be expected but i'm loving it i really like it, it it's uh i've never used one before so it was a little bit of a learning curve but it does it does make for some very pretty footage anyway uh what else do i have in here this thing uses a lot of power but it also uses some strange proprietary batteries uh, batteries I have never seen before so you can't buy them so what I've done is I've rigged up this little gadget a friend gave me gave me this it's a power bank it holds electricity yeah you can hear it and uh, this was the little charger that came with the gimbal for the two odd looking batteries and then a little cable and what I'll do is when the thing starts to, uh, it's got a little indicator, a light that blinks that shows you how much power you've got left. And when it gets down to the last bit of blinking, I just uh, hook it up to this and hey presto, within a few minutes, uh, the whole thing's charged up again. So that's fairly brilliant. My camera, but after looking at the map and deciding that this was a, um, this was going to be a really interesting habitat and probably a great place to find snakes, which was, was one of my favorite things to do is, is look, hunt down and photograph snakes. Uh, I just took the one lens and there's two ways you can go about that uh, if, if it's snakes you're interested in. Is either go with a lens that has a lot of reach to it, uh, which will allow you to, um, which will allow you to, to get good pictures relatively relatively far off from the the snakes but I'm I'm much more interested in getting close-ups um, particularly eye photographs uh, I love you know I love to get a good tight shot of the of the uh, the heads of snakes so um, I take a macro lens with me um, I have to get right on top of them but if I'm out with one of my long lenses looking for for birds or whatever and I come across a snake I usually can't even photograph it because the minimum focus distance on my on my 600 millimeter is about a quarter of a mile so I have to go fo so far back from it I usually can't uh, get the angle that I need so I decided today snaky looking place snaky lo looking weather uh, I'll just take the one macro lens an ENEL 15A battery never go never leave home without them I usually have two of these at all times and the one in the camera because you never know when you're going to need that what else is in here this is my little um, uh, bag of tricks for uh, audio on my um, videos it's just microphones and extension cables and adapters and things like that this, if I can get it off the clip, this is a terribly important uh, part of my um, 
my gear when I'm out uh, snake snake hunting. It, uh, it looks like a golf club almost all the way to the bottom and then at the bottom there's an anodized aluminium hook that um, this is a snake hook is what it is and it, um, it it's incredibly useful for picking up and moving snakes when you uh, when you want to do that. Now I try very hard not to use it to just pose snakes I try to shoot the snakes exactly where I find them but sometimes if I'm on really narrow paths and uh, I've come across some uh, some gigantic rattlesnakes um, and sometimes I'll, I'll nudge them out of the way with my snake stick and so sometimes just pick them up and move them uh, a little ways uh, to the side. Um, I have one of those Joby um, tripod thingy. I actually love it and uh, it's extremely useful to carry um, on this kind of trip where you're doing a, a bit of video and uh, you want to set the, uh, the, your iPhone up. I wouldn't ever put a camera on that. It's not nearly strong enough. It just sags when you put a, a decent bit of weight on it. This is a, uh, an uh, aluminium um, monopod. I've converted this to a different purpose. The way I use it, in case you hadn't already guessed, is um, I screw my um, gimbal onto it, like so. And uh, it, it holds it absolutely solidly, and uh, I can extend it. It goes about 400 yards, it feels like. Well, I'll show you. It really, really goes a long way. Which, if you're trying to get some aerial footage, um, or if you're trying to to take footage down a... Uh, oh, blimey, that thing's heavy. If you're trying to get footage uh, down the side of a boardwalk, for example, this thing just stretches out forever, and it's really quite light considering, uh, considering how far it goes. I'm not a gimbal, am I? I can't keep it steady. So that's all I have in the bag, aside from the, the, the um, telephone and the little microphone thing that I'm wearing, because the uh, telephone doesn't, doesn't have very good sound. To be honest, this doesn't have very good sound either. One other thing I didn't mention, but uh, is an absolute must when you're going adventuring, is a lot of this. Um, yeah, I have many a time uh, been, been on one of my uh, rambles and uh, come up short on water, and that's a bad idea, especially down here um, in, in Florida, we are today, uh, where the average temperature in Florida in summer is the same as that on the surface of Mercury. Uh, so, yeah, you want lots of water. Anyway, let's go walk a bit further and see if I can find any snakes and uh, maybe I'll uh, tell you a little bit about snakes or I could tell you something about pitcher plants. There's a lot of pitcher plants down here and wherever you see pitcher plants, snakes are sure to follow. So enough rest, let's get going. By and large, snakes are, are as terrified of you as you are of them. Uh, but that doesn't mean if they get surprised or cornered uh, that, they, that they won't retaliate. They don't really use their, their fangs and their venom to, to attack people. That's not their primary purpose. They, sh they certainly will use them for that uh, if, the, uh, if the occasion arises. But interestingly, a fairly significant proportion of snake bites don't involve the injection of venom, which is a very interesting fact. I'm not sure that anybody actually knows why this is. I suspect it's because venom is 
metabolically expensive for, uh, for snakes to make. It takes a lot of energy for them to make and, and store this. It, their venom's a mixture of enzymes that, that melt tissue so they can digest it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's precious to the snake. So it's, it's possible, I suppose, that when, uh, <coughs> when snakes are striking in self-defense, there's something about that action that prevents venom from being uh, released all the time. I don't know that. I'm just thinking that that would make, make sense. So that, you know, they can scare you off and you'll never go back in the woods again and they can then go kill a mouse for tea. Interesting idea. But really, the, uh, the purpose of their venom and their hollow teeth is um, to immobilize their prey. That's what they hunt with. If you ever see a snake feeding, it'll, it'll bite the, the prey, stick its uh, fangs into it, and then usually just leave it alone until it dies, and then they'll eat it whole. Fairly revolting way to uh, go about it, but there you go. That's snakes for you. Uh, so even though even though they they're not going to come after you, they don't chase after you. They're not lying in wait for you to come by. And given half a chance, they'll scarper if they see a human being. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful. If you don't know anything about snakes, uh, don't touch them. Don't go near them. Don't try to identify them by, for crying out loud, picking them up. It's just not worth it. If you're going to go out and look for snakes, make sure you know Make sure you know what your local species actually look like. And if you can't positively, unequivocally identify the snake as a non-venomous, harmless variety, just don't go near it. It's just not worth it. Like I say, they're not gonna come after you, but if they, uh, if they feel threatened, they will bite you. Now, Fortunately, or unfortunately, we don't live in Australia where every living thing has been designed to kill Australians, or visitors for that matter. They've got poisonous things over there that make our poisonous snakes uh, look like child's play. But we do have, we do have plenty of uh, poisonous and uh, a couple of uh, you know potentially deadly snakes probably the most dangerous snake in uh, in this part of Florida anyway would be a uh, an eastern diamondback rattlesnake crotalus horribilis is the name of it great name the committee did well on that one um, all but one of the snakes in the United States are in that same family of snakes, the pit vipers. They're called pit vipers because if you look at a picture of one, they have these holes in their face right underneath their eyes. And those, those uh, hollow areas are lined with cells that are incredibly heat sensitive and uh, they're like little infrared detectors and that's how snakes see their prey. Their eyesight's not particularly great but their uh, heat sensing is uh, and they're, they're all but the the coral snake which is also actually uh, indigenous to this part of the world though you seldom ever see them and their, their venom is a totally, different, uh, a totally different compound than the, uh, the typical pit viper venom. It's uh, a neurotoxin. 
uh, it, it bl blocks your nerves from working which will in short order stop you from breathing and that's how you die in a fair bit of agony I hear yeah the anti-venoms that we have over here for the pit vipers don't work on those snakes at all you have to get in touch with the the zoo and see if they've got any specific anti-venom for it if they're not venomous they can still give you a nasty bite and some of the water snakes uh, have really filthy mouths not something uh, you want to get bitten by but um, most of the other non-venomous snakes are fairly tolerant a lot of them will secrete this just disgusting smelling liquid out of uh, some glands near their cloaca that sprays this foul really repugnant fishy liquid onto your hands and that is a fairly good deterrent for picking them up this is looking more promising down here the grounds wet and boggy and there are a lot more pitcher plants down here oh let's let's talk about pitcher plants for a minute pitcher plants what makes them so fascinating well pitcher plants uh, eat flesh they eat insects they're carnivorous and uh, they have a very clever way of uh, of trapping them so here's a small cluster of uh pitcher plants out in the middle of the the path it's not really a path it's uh turning into a swamp now very promising looking snaky stuff anyway the the way these pitcher plants work is this uh, they put off a, an odor um, from their uh, i think from their reproductive parts down at the bottom of the flower i think that's where it comes from that smells, uh, I think, like rotting flesh or something like that, but it attracts flies. And the flies will come and they'll, they provided a nice perch for the flies right around there so that they can sit on there and sniff the delectable sewer odor coming from, from down inside. Which might be hard for me to show you. No, there you go. So they, they smell these odors and uh, the plant manages to uh, uh, secrete Oh jeez Something the size of a I don't know what that was just flew in my eye um, Ear I mean Anyhow God Gave me a fright So it, the flies what they do is obviously they they know there's something stinky down at the bottom there and they want to get it so what they do is they um they start trying to crawl down there but the plant makes this stuff that's very slippery and the whole inside of that stem is is hollow and full of the slippery stuff and down at the very bottom is a little lake of fluid uh, that contains enzymes uh, that uh, actually digest the fly and then it absorbs the dissolved fly like fly soup and uh, that's that's how they that's how they get their uh, nutrition amazing walk I didn't see any snakes coming back along the seaside part and um, this is not my cup of tea at all right how many shops do you need for beach balls they could just have one shop couldn't they there's a restaurant here that's called live bait I wouldn't eat there well I want to thank you for coming along it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure 
and um, got some other fun stuff coming up in the near future. Should have another video out in just a few days. If you want to check out any of my other stuff, go over to my website, do. It's uh, alanwallsphotography.com. Anyway, I hope you have a good week. I hope you take some nice photographs. And um, I'll see you soon. Stay safe. Cheers.